I Wanna Jump Like Dee Dee with me, Giles Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. Involved with the intense US punk rock scene of the of the early part of the eighties is, is only really part of the story for for Kira Rossler. Um, Kira joined Black Flag in nineteen eighty four. For me, what was possibly the most polarizing point in the in the band's career. But as I said, Black Flag is part of the story. Um, while she was in Black Flag, she was studying um, economics and system science, if I'm not mistaken, at UCLA. Um, which she then used to help create a career in post-production and dialogue editing. And since then, she has won two Emmys as a, as a dialogue editor and been part of an Oscar-winning sound editing teams, um, one of which was, was uh, which you'll know, is Mad Max Fury Road. She's also been writing and playing music um, intermittently with another immensely innovative bass player, Mike Watt, as, as DOS. Quite exciting yeah. as dose. My pronunciation. I'm from the north of England. Okay. But quite exciting. She's now about to release her first um, solo album, which is called quite simply Kira. So, Kira, welcome to I Want to Jump Like Dee Dee. Thank you so much for coming on. And thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Not at all. So, um, I've, I've, I've been very fortunate to have a, a, a listen to the album which which comes out on the on the 19th of October um and it's it's quite remarkable um I I, for me if I can just give you my take to to start with um it it, I mean I mean it feels very very sort of spacious I love the that it doesn't follow a conformist structure the, the songs don't follow a conformist structure and the and you're you're really um, you know, sort of innovative bass playing is allowed to, uh, to to lead. Essentially, you know, you kind of like it feels like you're sort of expressing yourself through the bass and the and the voice. Um, it feels really, you know, kind of unhurried, improvised, and very, very, very sort of personal. And you've released Ghosts as a as a single, which I think is probably the the most structured song on the on the album. But it's 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 immense, and and I believe if if I'm not mistaken that it was written over a, a sort of long uh, period, probably sort of 10, 10, 12 years, if I'm if I'm right. Uh, actually, I think the first song it is somewhat in chronological order uh, yeah. was about thirteen years ago. Thirteen years ago, okay, wow. So that's that's interesting from a from a kind of like an a, a, an, an evolution perspective. You know, that's that's going back to. You know, kind of like sort of two thousand and eight or so. Um, I, I think that, I think that's sort of fascinating. Sort of looking back at, you know, you know how how you how you were in two thousand eight. You know what your life looked like and and what you were creating at that that sort of time. I mean, how 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 did the the album all sort of come together? I mean, I realize that's a massive question. Well, the truth is that at any given point in my life, probably for. 20 years at least I have a set of songs in process Mm. (laughs) from simply tiny little ideas little riffs to more completed you know fleshed out uh, songs Mm. and um and my process always pretty much starts with some sort of concept feeling idea Mm. And then, as you say, the bass guitar is how I express myself. So, yeah. so the bass has to then put a voice literally to that concept or emotion. And the words almost always come after. They certainly get reformatted as the mm. music takes shape. Mm. And, um, and this particular set of songs... Um, they tell a story as I suggested. So, mm. so when I was quite kindly asked by Kitten Robot to, to put out a solo record at 60 years old, which I just, it was just the right time. And it felt kind of cool. I've been mm. doing this, like I said, for many years. So, mm. uh, so there was, a, there's a whole body of 
work, if you will, this set of songs just, I thought, had had a specific sort of identity to a told a specific story. And that's, um, that's part of what led me to begin it at the beginning of the story, uh, which was this, the first song uh, called Silently that I wrote um, about what was happening then. And, and the last song we were putting finishing touches on this year before we completed the record, so. Mm. Could you could, can can you sort of pinpoint what was why 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 it was the right time for you for you to do it? Well, I've actually never. The goal was never to release to release yeah a record. I make music for the joy of making it and to express myself. It is somewhat how I process my life. Yeah, and and I did and the part about like sharing it with others and, and worse, like having them critique it mm. is, was not as attractive as a part of it. Um, and my brother, Paul of Kitten mm. Robot Studio and Records had, had often suggested that I should tie a bow around some of these things. But for whatever reason, when he asked this time and, and, and Kitten Robot Records actually existed as an entity that, that, could somewhat stand behind it. Um, and I wasn't just, you know, shoving something out on Bandcamp and saying, hey, listen to me. Yeah, you know, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's a little, feels a little different. It has a little bit of support, if you will. And, and like I said, I had turned 60 this year and I thought now is the time. Also, I think there's a, there's a little distance from some of the gut-wrenching pain associated <laughs> with some of the songs and I I, mm. I don't feel quite as um devastated by the um I mean I still cry if I listen to it but yeah. but you know there is there's enough distance that it sort of felt like I could look at it a little more I think objectively and not uh, and not be caught up mm. as I said uh, in these sort of as you mentioned too this very personal yeah. expression of of what had gone on and what was going on and so um so that i think helped when i looked at this set of songs uh, some and and, it, and they were somewhat complete paul and i had worked on the final you know sort of polishing of them the most so they mm. were somewhat almost ready <laughs> wow is it is, i i've i i really like this um it, it, it's a quote from Nelson Mandela, and I won't be able to remember it sort of word for word, but in essence, he, he said, you, you only have to see how much you changed as a person to go back to something that hasn't changed in your past that hasn't changed. So, you know, you kind of go back to a to an old house. And I, I have this when I go back to my parents. Well, it's not my parents now, but was recently go back to their house and you see the, the like the kind of the memories and it makes you realize how much as, a, as an individual that you've changed as well. I mean, I had like going back to though that, you know, the song that you sort of, that you first wrote, how did that feel, you know, going back to, to, to that particular point in time? Um, well, for, for me, like I said, that the songwriting had been a, a continuous process. So I'm not sure that in that given moment, I was mm. doing anything different than I had been doing, yeah. which is, you know, I, I have worked most of my adult life and, and my music is my, my happy place, if you yeah, will, or yeah. my, or my, you know, place where I work out my problems, whatever, you know, so, so that's that space over here that I have. And, and I think that's part of why there was never a real drive to release it because it's sort of this little place for me in my room. Yeah. <laughs> and although I share it with the other collaborators who've done amazing work on it as well, um, it does represent and has represented this, this part of me that, um, that is somewhat private or felt that yeah. way at the time. So I, I yeah. think it's probably very much at that time, um, me taking a private moment to acknowledge actually, you know, sort of that rift 
of mm. of going to work every day and that that issue of having to um leave my home and every day mm. and the choices made about um you know career and whatnot yeah, like uh, yeah. you know many musicians won't choose the path i chose they'll choose the path of of struggling to try to make a, a living at music which was always kind of unattractive to me mm, the, the starving mm. artist thing I, I i went through periods of my life without a lot mm. of food and and without a lot of money and and it was not a place that i embraced as yeah comfortable or uh, or particularly easy to then express myself you know it didn't necessarily facilitate music to to me and I watched my um my older brother who very much did take that path of yeah. of both having children to support and somewhat struggling to support yeah. um his artistic uh you know interests and and desires so um so it it was in a sense just another day but in another sense um starting to capture you know an idea uh and and in, and i and somewhat my voice um hit a uh a connection you know yeah. I, I i've written many songs that don't hit as hard you know yeah, to me yeah. you know so so if i go through this these many songs you know some will hit me harder than others and 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 this one may be one of the the early times when i i was able to capture what i was trying to say maybe mm. that much better than in 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 songs past yeah yeah i mean i i, I think yeah yeah I, I can i can totally see that and and the you know your your voice your vocals you know, with with the no, with the with, with the bass that 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 is, I think it's it's just sort of really beautiful. It's very um, it, it for me when I when I listen to it, it kind of make it makes me sort of look look inside, you know, almost. You know, you kind of like think, okay, what is this sort of saying saying to me? It really really kind of like almost sort of encourages that. Um, I think that very you know, much the, trying to make people feel something, and I've always thought music was about making people feel and and yeah. I don't like music that doesn't make me feel anything Absolutely. even yeah. if it's rage you know express yeah. the rage I mean and punk rock and and a lot of what that was about mm. you know that facilitated expressing that and it made me feel when I listened to it mm. that part of of life you know mm. so so sure the desire is absolutely for you to feel something or to connect in your own life to something that I'm feeling. Mm. Are, are, you, are you still playing um, piano as well? Because I know that you, you studied the piano when you, were, when you were a lot, going back to when you were a kid, you know, when you were a lot younger, you, st you studied the piano. Is, that, is this something that you've... I don't. I am completely and utterly a bass player and have been for very many years. I don't feel limited by it. Mm. Um, I know that sounds odd because I no, lean no, no, over no. and play this tiny little piano in the yeah. video, which I actually thought might come across somewhat clownish, but um, yeah. it didn't. <laughs> but no, uh, that my brother is the piano player of the family yeah. and plays when I, when on I, that song. When I was a when I was a when I was a kid, um, I think I was eight years old, and um, I um, I played the cello. So another you know kind of bass like. You know, sort of instrument, but obviously, it. you know, kind of classically, classically sort of trained. Uh, it was my dad that sort of pushed me into it and uh, said, "Push me." He, he did push me into it, and um, you know, I, I I did really well at it. But I got to the the stage um, when I was about fifteen or sixteen, and I my my other love, which I couldn't reconcile as a kind of teenager, my other love was was punk rock. And I, I couldn't, like, I was playing classical music, but I was listening to, you know, kind of like, sort of, like, fierce music. And I just couldn't see them. I just couldn't see them going together. So I gave up, I gave up the cello. And mm -hmm. it was a, about a couple of years ago, I went back to a, to a music store in London and, and uh, you know, picked one up. I went into the shop and said, can I, I'm just intrigued. Can I just try it? It was fascinating. It brought all these memories back. 
was unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that when punk rock started, my brother, you know, sort of couldn't see how piano and, and mm. keyboard fit in. And, and and our first band, he played drums because he, he didn't know. And then we, you know, out of, as luck would have it, there was one keyboard band in Los Angeles called the Screamers that, yeah. um, that and he ended up joining, which was was really a revelation because that just didn't exist in anybody else's definition of, yeah. of what punk rock was. So I get that. I, and I, I think that um, in a way for me, the way the bass guitar was evolving, actually I picked up the bass because my brother's progressive rock band needed yeah. a bass player, right? Yeah. And, and of course I was never good enough to do that, but he got into punk rock and, and that facilitated my ability to you mm. know playing sort of rock type music was just not quite as as challenging for my beginning bass player uh hands and etc so um I think that all of that stuff shapes you like you said just what what are my interests what's happening in the day you know yeah. what it, what does that instrument do in this context or not mm. I mean the, the, you, I mean so just talking for a little minute about about those days just in terms of um you know what what that you know in terms of um i don't know, like kind of character building or, or 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 kind of things that you that you really learned you know kind of like, like those sort of um you know what what it gave you you know we uh, you know the, obviously the, the you know the time that you joined Black Flag was um, it, it, I think I, I do think it was pivotal. You know because it it, it kind of you know that album My War had, had sort of um, uh, polarized people. You know that that kind of like sort of punk rock community between the forward thinking and those that wanted to hear the same the same kind of stuff. So to tour, I mean just just kind of like the there's obviously the physical side of the of the touring as well. But you, what, I mean just in terms of what you learned. You know, from from that, I mean, it was only you know, sort of two three years, I think, that you 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 were there, but obviously, quite a big part. But what what, what did it really kind of give you? Well, um, they were my favorite band when I joined, so mm. so that was so it was super cool to yeah. be to ask to join. Um, but what and what many people may not know or or don't you know necessarily associate with that point in time was that there had been an uh, injunction against the name black flag for quite some time and they had been working very hard in legal matters to get out from under that to be able to release mm. um my war and and so and so for the musical shift had already happened happened yeah you know this was this was in a way the release of <clears throat> my war was late to the yeah. to a shift that had already happened mm -hmm. it um it drove greg to seek out a different type of bass player because he was trying to do something different with his music mm -hmm. uh, at least that was the interpretation that, that i had about yeah. it um so so the um the audience's frustration mm. or whatever would have occurred regardless of regardless of me you know I, I was not in that band and and in my opinion is bands are rarely democracies yeah yeah, yeah. you know the songwriter generally even if there's a front person that you as as a watcher associate with the band the songwriter is generally speaking the um the guy who's calling the shots and, yeah, and there yeah. are usually people who are somewhat team members and and that's what very much what I was. I was there to support what they were doing. I yeah. was not creating what they were doing. Um, I was often accused of being the thing that was ruining black mm -hmm. flag. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did have shorter hair than any of them, so uh, you know I wasn't. I didn't feel comfortable with the accusation. <laughs> but um, but I was for you know was absolutely fully on board this exploration of mm. of growth i, I mm. still to this day for me the sort of 
rehash thing of bands going back on tour after being broken up for a, it has never driven me and never yeah. interested me to participate in uh and doing some old thing I was doing a long time ago like I think yeah. moving forward and and doing new things is uh makes more sense yeah yeah so it made total sense to me what they were doing and but I was merely a team member and a supporter of the process mm. no I, I agree with you I, I think I think the, the you know the, the the creativity and the again you know the, obviously this 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 is about mindset you know and, and in wanting to you know evolve as a as a and, and grow as a person by you know kind of being open-minded to sort of new new ideas is 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 the way is the way to grow um you, you know it, it's like how, how are you going to ask, I, i'm not sure how you can kind of keep engaged in in sort of what you're doing when you're doing the same well, thing it's like you know like with the people who have regular jobs you know how are you going right, to right. stay working in the same job for like kind of 40 50 years which is what we're looking at these well days. how can you say what you need to say i mean here music is this form of expression mm. how can i say who i am today by saying yeah. the same thing i'm just saying 30 years ago you know yeah. it, it, it's impossible for for me and for my way of thinking to um to be in that mindset I, it's it's yeah. not me anymore i'm not in my 20s anymore that's who i was then and, yeah, I, and I have absolutely. no regrets and i'm extremely proud of the work and the and the time mm. uh, and i don't mind talking about it it's it's a big part of me but it's not it's not me it's not <laughs> it's you a, no it's absolutely. A, a peak period of time you know? yeah and then, then, you know, sort of shifting into into kind of the the corporate world, you know, sort of post Black Flag, and obviously you you were sort of still writing music with with Mike for a sort of period of time, but then that sort of you know using your education and almost um, shifting, using that to to you know kind of like progress yourself in terms of your you know kind of career and and stuff that how did how did you uh, how did you find the corporate world the the, the sort of the adjustment to it. Well, look, I had studied, as you pointed out, economics and computers at school simply because mm. I thought, look, if I can't make a living at music, I need a plan B. And I yeah, thought, look, yeah. computers are the future and there will be work in that arena. It was this very pragmatic idea. You know, mm. here's my plan B. Well, and if, if, <laughs> if I could interrupt, it's actually very forward thinking at that time as well. Well, and my father actually started the computer department at Yale University many years oh, wow. before. Ah, okay. And I had been in a room of computers doing something very much like Pong. Yeah. You know, wow. at, yeah. on a huge mainframe computer. So I did have that as part of my, yeah. you know, a bag of tricks to choose from. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it did influence me. Um, but but yes, it was it was a matter of, uh, as I said, the, the starving artist thing mm. was not uh, appealing to mm. me. Mm. I told Black Flag when I joined that I was not going to quit school, that I would, you know, take time off, but that I was going to finish. And I finished right after they kicked me out. And then then I was faced with the reality of, you know, getting a job. And actually, the guy who was running the computer department at Yale University, who my father had hired many years before, offered mm. to give me my first computer job. Right. And um and 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 trying to get a computer job, they always want experience. So I wasn't having any luck in LA anyway. And here this thing sort of fell in my lap. He'd let me work for a year. He wasn't gonna he wasn't concerned about me making some long-term commitment, but rather would help me get some experience. So my first job out of college was the academic environment, which is a little different than the yeah. corporate world. Yeah. But I was only there for a year. And, and during that time, Mike and I were sending four tracks back and forth and yeah. doing Do uh, Dose's first record. I actually flew home from New Haven to LA to for us to record that first record yeah. um so so I was keeping that ball in the air it also was hugely influential on my other recordings which were bedtime stories for my very young nephews yeah. who I didn't want to have forget me 
Yes. So I would yes, read, yeah. tell stories and write bass lines. And, and I started to learn this weaving two bases together through mm -hmm. that as much as anything. Dose was in a way a reflection of what I had already been uh, working on. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. but when, but a year after I started, basically, I came back to LA and got my first computer job here, which was very much a, a corporate job. And as you can imagine, I felt like a fish out of water. <laughs> um, I borrowed some dresses from my uh, brother's mother-in-law that didn't fit me, mm. and I had nylon stockings and you know and and in heels, and and oh, I had the already corporate started, uniform. I had sort of been through that in the at Yale. Mm. You know, it was it, there was somewhat of a dress code there, and I was somewhat unable to conform I tried and and but it was even more so uh at the in the corporate world here and and more importantly than the attire there was uh you know the sort of mindset mm. of being in the corporate world I I literally have spent most of my life <laughs> in all contexts school work mm. bands I try to have my skill set override my personality quirks, right? So, so I tried to be really good at my job because I knew that my personality quirks would uh, potentially create uh, issues for me. Issues but, it's funny, yeah. but it's funny, the first guy who hired me here, I told him I was a musician and to him computers and music worked very well Just together. That, was, that was a plus to him he knew yeah. other musicians who were good at computing so um but but in terms of your question of this you know trying to to fit this square mm. peg in that round hole it was a constant struggle and and you know i'm also someone who wears my emotions on my sleeve which there's absolutely no room for in the corporate world right absolutely, so you might yeah. find yeah. me yeah. crying in the stairwell you know which was not appropriate at all i'll yeah. never forget the day that i had um i had made a mistake and and this whole set of transactions had gone through wrong and i was in the stairwell crying mm -hmm. And then it came to me, I could just fix it. Yeah. You know, and, and again, so I, so I, uh, my skill set, you know, helped me, you know, overcome, overcome that the moment. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, for years, this went on. <laughs> for yeah. 11 years, I worked in computers and felt like a fish out of water. And then I finally met, uh, at, purely as a fluke, my brother was be a composer, being a composer for this student film, and a mm -hmm. guy uh, from USC Film School was doing the sound for this film, and they brought me in to do some bass. Mm -hmm. And I met this guy who was doing what suddenly <laughs> struck me as the perfect field yeah. for me. It it used computers, it mm -hmm. used sound, <laughs> yeah. and it was like, hey, and I just basically it together. I twisted his arm and said, listen, I'll answer your phones. I'll do invoicing. I'll work as an admin chick. You can pay me eight bucks an hour yeah. and I'll take a huge cut and pay. Just let me come and I will learn a skill and I will um, be able to um, yeah. help. And, and, and again, in that same vein, learn to contribute, find the skill. It turned out that dialogue was the area that the guys weren't that interested in. <laughs> they yeah. liked the guns and the explosions and the cars and mm. the vehicles, you know, they, they, the nitty gritty detail of the dialogue work wasn't as appealing. So I, there was this niche and I took advantage and started really focusing in on that. Um, but again, it just fell in my lap and, just and felt felt right and and the big thing that's right about it and still right to this day is that you're working with creative people yeah. frankly my job isn't that creative mm. but but i'm around people who are creative so that that the temperament of the industry is just a little less <laughs> corporate yeah. Even though, I mean, you're working for a corporation, you're working for Warner Brothers or you're working for Disney or whatever, right? You, they, they are corporations, 
but you're part of this small creative team yeah, team and yeah. you're there in support of a creative director who who had who you just need to make happy mm. and that creative director is probably wearing blue jeans you know yeah, yeah so so there is a hierarchy still just like in the corporate world which actually played to my advantage because I knew how to play that game mm. the hierarchy the, yeah. the who's the boss very clear my opinion's not required what do you need you know I had that skill um but I was able to sort of relax some of the veneer that I had to have up in the corporate world. Um, plus, projects come and then they end. And there are spaces. And in the spaces, I might get to do a little more music. More music, so also, yeah, of course, yeah. So it also sort of schedule-wise had some characteristics that were really good for me. Mm, I totally hear about that. I mean, I used to, I used to, I mean, I used to work in the, corporate world and quit uh we're about three years ago three years ago now and um I, I i i totally totally hear you um you know it kind of got to got to a stage i, I can and i'm at the stage now I, I can't even imagine being back in that now i can't even imagine it you know and and it, it just it's funny, there's, there's a the longer that you work in it there's a sort of there's a fear thing you know about sort of making making that step and that's that's one thing that i've learned you know about myself is you know about fear is sometimes just taking that step and going for it and since since I've, I've been out you know I've met, met so many more creative people and obviously you know people through this podcast and you, you know getting over fear and just you know not letting it limit you well I think what I learned is by being part of a small team my contributions matter and mm. in, in the corporate world you're yeah. part of you're a very small cog small in a cog. very large wheel yeah. and that can be useful if yeah. you're someone who just wants to punch the clock and sort of have your yeah. job be a be a you want to be kind of invisible mm. and i and i didn't realize that until i was out i think if i had been part of a software company mm. for whom doing this was you know the direction of the whole company it would have suited me fine yeah it yeah, wasn't yeah. The, the computer work it was the fact that for me working that hard and then being someone of just a thorn in the company side a cost center yeah you know yeah. was so sort of unfulfilling absolutely absolutely right i i, I totally hear you and, and the you know the sort of opportunities to to sort of use your creativity and I think what's gross great from what you said there is that it's, it's going to essentially I guess like freelance that that sort of basis like you say that that's a really good point that the projects come and go they have a you know kind of start point and end point and then you can and then there's your new time. people it's and new people. yes and even if you're even if you have another job you have to go right to it's new people it's a new, new people. project there's all this freshness to it you're yeah. not just slogging through the same job and the same with the same set of people so for it did suit me <laughs> much better i mean i mean it gives you it gives you um i mean what one thing that i re really sort of enjoy now is for, for a kind of healthy mind is the sort of the the diversification of things that you can do so you know kind of corporate will use the you, you know sometimes you you get varied things but broadly that's that's your role and i think with the you know the sort of the future of work how future of work is looking you know, with people you know just living and working a lot longer for a longer number of years you cannot stay or, or perform at a, at a at a sort of high level or a good level for that length of time when you're just doing the one thing you, you've got to have these different stimuluses in your life that totally makes sense i mean we know in the old days you worked at one company your whole life and i and yeah. i think even with corporate people and and people in manufacture or whatever that doesn't work with today's lifespans as you say it, you yeah. know it, it's just you know and and we're not retiring at the same age as they were yeah. retiring either. <laughs> totally yeah that, i mean i mean you, you know my, my dad was um he, he was exactly that he, you, know, you know got his education um you know got his he was a, a mechanical engineer got his engineering qualification himself but then worked in the in the in the, the job for 30 years 
took early retirement and then did little bits of things on his own. So he's kind of starting to do, and that was at the end of the eighties. That was 1987. I think when he, when he retired, took early sort of early retirement, 1987. Oh my God. My dad uh, took, took a very unconventional uh, approach when he uh, was in computers at, mm. at, at, uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. And when I was eight years old, he just said, I, I got to get out of the rat race. And we moved to mm. the Caribbean. Oh, to, to, to Curacao, was it? To Curacao. And mm. he um, began being an underwater photographer and eventually oh, wow. started um, running scuba diving tours all over the world. This ah, became right. his new. So he did exactly what you're talking about. He cut the tie, he took the risk, he jumped. Uh, jumped into this whole new thing and, and turned it into this huge career. Um, and, and in that tiny little part of the, you know, that industry, he's a very well-known mm. underwater photographer and, um, person. And uh, so, he, so I did have that example you know, yeah, in yeah. front of me of someone who did take that risk. When you say, I mean, you say, it, it, it's it's interesting sort of think thinking back to that era and and doing that is is kind of quite quite a quite a risk this is late 60s he was late 60s i was eight yeah. years old in 1969 so yeah. we moved to the caribbean and he left the corporate world wow. then wow. you know so wow. yeah, the, yeah this was not done <laughs> no of course of course, yeah, I've got my timings wrong. Yeah, of course, that would that would have been been earlier. Of course. How how do you remember? How do you remember what his sort of reaction or how he how he kind of um, handled that? I mean, I know you're you're kind of eight years old when that happened, but the funny thing is, and, and this will make sense to parents, is it was probably very important to them for us to not sense the the yeah. <laughs> fragile thing the, uh, you know <laughs> the, the right so 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 there wasn't a sense of sort of financial insecurity or or that kind of stuff we had a a nice home in and we were going to dutch schools it's a dutch island yes um, so we were focused on on trying to become fluent in a, in a new language and and catching up in our schoolwork and 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 then we were scuba diving every afternoon. So the perception from my standpoint was that everything was fine. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't have I didn't have a sense that he was living on the edge the way he must have been feeling. Feeling, know? yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but, you know, as parents are like to do, he didn't want me to feel that insecurity. So, uh, and he's not a man of, of, you know, expressing his emotions mm. to too openly you know so mm. he he played that part of it close to the best mm. I, th I think the sort of world world today is um you know sort of quite you know in, in in lots of ways it's sort of very volatile and sort of uncertain there's a lot of much more uncertainty around these days how, how does the, in 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 what you're doing what you're doing now how does how does uncertainty make you feel you know and, I, I could, and, and as, as you um you know with all respect as you, as you get older as well you know because I think great for, question. <laughs> it's a great question because this industry is is completely volatile right like yeah. so so your schedule is changes hmm. I have a I have a movie that I was supposed to start at the beginning of October, yeah. then it was the beginning of November. Now it's January, right. you know, so, so you can, being freelance, you can just be, you know, sort of a leaf in the wind. And, and my nature is very much to be a planner and a scheduler. So even after all these years of working in this very volatile environment, I have a tendency to get stressed by change. And by these changes that yeah. are happening all the time, yeah. So, yeah. so it's it doesn't feel like it's in my nature. It, but it feels very like it's good for me because mm. I'm having to accept what is true anyway, which is that life is constantly shifting and changing, yeah. and I have no control over anything. And and mm. and so so I'm very much in an environment now where that is constantly reinforced. And 
and of course music is like that too it's like that right? anyway but yeah where you have you can have no real game plan and I, and this record is a perfect example of that of something where i said oh okay we'll we'll see what happens and frankly the music is so strange and you know if if you if you're a you know kira from black flag flag person you know you're going to listen to this and this is not necessarily what you would associate you know, and, I, and so my expectation was, you know, potentially a lot of discomfort with, mm. you know, what what it was. And and people have been extremely kind about it so far. Maybe I'm just not hearing the, the negative mm. stuff. But um, it's funny when you said the ghosts is more, a more one of the more, you know, traditional songs. I was like, <sighs> It's, it's so hard to take. To I, take. I, didn't, I didn't say it was structured. It's more structured. <laughs> but this is, we're human beings, right? So, so you know, it's, and when, and when your music is your heart, you know, yeah. you, and here you are putting it out in front of people, it's impossible to take the feedback, which is part of why there was yeah. never any desire to, to put it out. With work, I, I get the same way, frankly. If mm. someone has something negative to say about my work, I'll, you know, I'll be crushed like a bug inside yeah. too, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that sensitivity is mm. possibly part of what makes up an artistic temperament. Is yeah. is that that sort of not much of a thick skin? I I tend to take those feelings and just translate them into another song. You know? It's funny, isn't it? I, I, it's it's really interesting. This the the, the that that as you, as you say that that sort of fragility, um, and I I know like for myself sometimes you know if if, if I'm working on something and it, and it is my, I feel like it's my thing. You know that kind of protect protective. I've I've created this something that I'm really, like one hundred percent like into my baby. This. Yeah. And then, you know, somebody comes on and will say perfectly reasonably, you know, and if you if you try to disassociate yourself, what they're saying is totally reasonable. Yes, I get it. And there's still a spikiness. Nah, no, they, they can't possibly be right. You're you're being vulnerable and, and frankly, you know, making art or putting something personal out there it does make you vulnerable and 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 some people just aren't willing to go there mm -hmm. they don't want to feel that vulnerable i mm -hmm. mean it doesn't get much less vulnerable than like mm -hmm. in dose where we just say well no drums no guitar yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. here we are bass <laughs> But, but but interestingly on, on the on the other side of the coin there are, there are those that will say you know we you know, I can't, I can't make somebody like what I'm doing, or, or, you know, which, which is true in it, true in itself, and say, well, we just got to go with it, got to go with it. You can't force people to like it. I'm just going to go with it. Well, and that's part of why it made sense to me to separate the making a living part from yeah. the musical expression part because. Mm. If you're stuck with, I have to somehow please people because that way I will sell records or something. Well, good luck. Very good point, few point. do. And, and it's very difficult to predict that you'll be able to. So you may live a very impoverished lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day and it was about, you know, a particular artist and about how, you know, the whole thing with this artist has been completely sort of manufactured i mean i mean this has been going on for years right hasn't it but 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 it, like now it's it's still sort of going on you know when we talk a lot about um how important it is not just in music but in, in all kind of walks of life to be authentic you know and that's how you that that's what what people are looking for and and a lot of people are needing authenticity in who they deal with whether it's in personal life or or business or or entertainment and this is this manufacturing is still happening yeah i don't know i don't know what that is because i don't know i mean in some ways 
I'm able to sometimes see through and hear through something that is somewhat manufactured. And there is mm. sometimes something underneath that I can connect to. So I do challenge myself to connect to whatever it is that some, that other people often are connecting to, you know, um, but as you say, this has been going on all along and, and what gets big and what sells mm. record and what, you know, this is, is very difficult to predict. You know, I, I don't think anyone would even have heard of punk rock mm. if it wasn't for bands like the Chili Peppers and Nirvana yeah. getting big and saying, hey, these are our influences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sort of pointing to something uh, and, exactly, and having a yeah. lot of people reading and hearing that and saying, oh, this must be significant. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, yeah. The, the um, with, with the, the, the album, with, with the album Kira, um, did you find, obviously, the, 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 the themes in there are sort of personal to you. To you. Did you find that when, when you're writing that, that you've... Um, you've 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 allowed your um how do, how do i say this? so it's sort of to allowed your curiosity to um to you've allowed curiosity to kind of investigate some of these issues that you've you've felt and that you felt empowered to write about you know is it, is it kind of like opened your mind and your your to, to to looking at some of these issues and what they mean to you well i think that i mean I, as you say, it is a lot of it's very personal. And a lot of times I'm trying to be just very honest mm -hmm. and clear. But there is, because this is part of my personality, a tongue in cheek or or ironic sensibility mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so so I might twist just a little bit to the to the ironic or the and and that's partially because that's how I do see the world you know yeah. it, it, sometimes we have to we have to laugh or, or or make fun of because otherwise it's just too painful you know? too painful yeah all right so mm. um so in that way you know i think like i do explore that sometimes mm. um take it to the absurdity a little bit and mm. and in, and in this record maybe less than than in a lot of the other stuff that i write you know I may have a little more of a tinge of of humor and sarcasm because mm. um because that's how I react to things uh that are going on and especially things I don't understand or can't control and mm. and yet have to accept you mm. know it feels it feels like that there's the, the there's you know kind of like on honesty and in sort of what, what you're writing and, and expressing, which again, I think, I think for, you know, talking about that word, um, you know, kind of authenticity, and it's, a, it's a word that's used a, used a lot these days, as well as, as well as sort of relatability. But I think that I, I, do, I do think that that is what people are looking for in their lives. It's okay. Well, I can, I can relate to what, I, what, what Kira is writing here and what I'm feeling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't, I mean, I, I guess I don't really, think that a lot of people are looking for authenticity I, I think it may be in spite of their mm. barriers they're still human so yeah, so I, yeah. I think you know I hope to connect but I also get that we keep these barriers up because okay, yeah. we don't want to show our vulnerability necessarily mm. to everyone to a stranger right so mm. so I think that uh, we may say we're looking mm. for authenticity. Yeah. And, I mean, it for me, it goes all the way back to uh, I was probably 14 and and a friend of a good friend of mine had a cassette um, called Music for Torching, Billie mm. Holiday. Yes. Yeah. Right. And Billie Holiday embodies this humanity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, she's not a song prolific songwriter you know mm. they're not her songs but but the way she <laughs> sings them to you yeah you can't help but feel and even as her voice stopped being as strong and it shifted and it aged naturally like it does for all of us she could still put so much so much yeah. into it and and that hit me 
I think that musical tastes hit, a, there's a certain age at which some of our formative stuff happens and, and 14, mm -hmm. you know, for me, <clears throat> it was some of that, you know, and, yeah. and that always struck me that, that, that sharing that vulnerability and the connection that I felt, you know, spoke to me as a, a kind of music and musical mm -hmm. expression that, that mattered, but, you know, how many people put on a Billy Holiday record, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, you know, that's where I question, I don't know whether that's, you know, what other people are listening to, but I hear, I mean, listen to Billie Eilish sing, she has a beautiful voice, yeah, she and she connects does. to some very, Absolutely. you know, deep emotion and expresses it, so it happens, it, mm. if you're looking for it. Yeah. It, yeah, it's, it, it's, it, I, it, I take your point on you know you know that that, that you know perhaps not every, maybe maybe this is just me kind of my interpretation and basically sort of projecting what I'm I'm feeling, but the the, the yeah but, but the, people people do have that guard you know that they don't like down we you know we all we all have it um, but it's interesting when when you get some you know some artists and a and a, and a, and a kind of creative um scene such as music which you know has the you know kind of like has the ability to you know turn even the hardest soul that you get an artist as you say you know sort of like like billy eilish that shows you know kind of real vulnerability billy holiday has done that in the past you're ab absolutely right you know those sort of artists that almost start to then you can see the the way being paved you know for okay well Maybe I need to, maybe I now need to look at myself. Yeah, I mean, punk rock was like that too, right? We yeah. needed to connect to our anger and our rage mm. and, and, and that was offered to us and we greedily. <laughs> you you accepted today, so I'm going to have a lot of that, yeah. Right, because I, I, this, this speaks to me right now at this time. I, I'm surprised in some ways that punk rock speaks to so many people. You know, I mean, whatever punk rock is, and we could debate that for an hour, but the but the fact that it's so mainstream, which almost by definition means it isn't punk rock. It isn't, but, yes. Yeah. But the fact that the people know, you know, they know artists, people have heard of Black Flag. I mean, mm. <laughs> we were starving. Nobody had heard of us, you know, yeah. so... So it, the fact that people I still identify, I think, must come from that same rage, you know, inside that no one was speaking to for mm. us, you know, and maybe still today people need to speak to that language too, you know, yeah, and yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, classical music is hugely emotional it too. Is. You know, I, I think that it's there. It's it's a matter of t each individual and how much they're looking to be touched. Mm -hmm. And and some aren't. Some people want to dance, so they they listen to something that makes them want to move more than feel. You know, and that's totally fine. There's there's music there for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on on, on an earlier episode of um, of one of my podcasts, I was, I was talking to. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him, a guy called Dave Haslam, who's a DJ uh, at the Hacienda in Manchester in the UK. Um, when Factory Records and, you know, you know then there's the, the, the sort of the Hacienda scene with the Happy Mondays and all that. And he said his job as a DJ was um, not, not, to, not for him to engage with the, the people dancing, but for them to engage with each other. You know, so it's almost like this sort of thing about human connection and humanity actually for people there listening to the music and connecting by that same those kind of same values almost which i thought was a really interesting way to think yeah about. so they are getting in touch with themselves they're just getting in touch with maybe a different part of themselves mm. and a social aspect that somebody else is alone in their room wanting to weep openly <laughs> and someone else wants to to dance alongside with someone and feel the connection through the movement of their bodies you know it's it's all fair game right yeah absolutely it is it is so with the the, the, the um sort of just sort of finally on the on the on the um on the record you you, you talked earlier that 
for you the um the, the the interesting part is making the music what what was the, what was the influence behind re- going that next step and and releasing it and and how how did you feel about about doing that it was quite simply maybe the fourth or fifth time my brother had said to me you know you should put out a solo record and kitten robot uh, we'll we'll put it out Mm. and and it was like well wait somebody wants to put out my record and i and i met with the key people uh two key people in at kitten robot records and and the fact that really frankly that anyone would come to me and say hey i know you've got this stuff (laughs) you should put it out you know, I have a tendency in my life to let what falls in my lap happen. You know, I've described it to you in a couple of times in my life where, you know, something falls into place in this moment in time. And as I said, I, I think it crossed my mind that I'm 60 and like, like when, if not now, when, Mm, (laughs) you know, and so, and, and then these people are, offering you this thing you know you can you can just go no no and and I said to them look nobody's gonna buy this record it's really weird you know it's not gonna sell a lot of re- if you if what you think is like well Kira from Black Flag is gonna sell a bunch of records that's not what's gonna happen I mean look those people have heard of those those does not sell records yeah yeah you know, yeah. I'm kind of surprised in some of the interviews I've been doing, people all seem to know about it. It's like, well, they don't buy the records. They, buy they might know about it, but they don't buy it. <laughs> and I think for, that was true for Black Flag a lot of times. Think of all the people who've heard of Black Flag and how many of them have purchased a record. Mm. So there's a very, so, so there was a part of me that said, look, as long as we understand, <laughs> we'll mm. put the thing out and, and it's not, it's not that it's going to, be some financial boon for the record company as long as we we understand that that you know i'm not retiring on my royalties and you're not you know taking the next step with the record label <laughs> you know we don't have any misguided perception of what's coming let's go for it you know mm-hmm. it, it felt right you know it, it, as long as that was understood you know because i I hate to let people down. I'm like that in my work. I, you know, if there was any sort of misunderstanding, I'd have felt terrible, you know, so it was important for me to say, look, this stuff is, is strange and, and it's not going to, it's not necessarily going to hit people where they want to be hit. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, as long as that was the case, it's like, yeah, we want to do this and, and, and sort of damn the torpedoes. We don't care what, comes out mm. of it yeah, yeah and I got into that mindset it's like okay we're gonna do this and, and we don't know what's gonna happen with it people have been very kind and and, and been interested in talking about it and that part al- already is somewhat surprising to me but um but that's what happened is that they sort of offered this without strings without expectations and and that's how I <laughs> that's what makes sense to me yeah uh, I mean that's I mean I'm if, if 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 I'm just trying to sort of relate that to me, that would feel like a like quite a quite a weight lifted. Think, thinking about how I am as a person, I I I hear you when you say you know you don't like letting people down, and you know if if people have expectations, you don't meet them. I, I I'm I'm the same with that, and I I think it's it, it's strong to to have that conversation and say okay, this is where we are. This is so there are, there are no kind of misconceptions it's like okay it's kind of quite liberating and freeing to be able to 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 then go ahead and do it and, and really sort of show the the kind of the unconformist you know kind of like the experimental let's just it, see what we and create. like i said this is why i've always separated the money making from so that i can yeah. truly express myself and i can truly say it's okay if nobody connects to this i get it um, but this is me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Listen, Kira, thank you so much. It's been fascinating. I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I could talk for hours. I think it's 
brilliant. It's really interesting talking to you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I hope everything continues to go uh, swimmingly in your life. And uh, and I'll just keep doing this weirdo thing I do over here. You Non-conformist all the way. I'm, I'm gonna hold you. I'm gonna way. hold you to that. Definitely. Absolutely. I am a punker. <laughs>